So there are going to be three main reasons to use a quantum computer in the future. One like this. First is for calculating the real world. We're talking physics, chemistry and material science. Quantum computers are actually great at simulating what happens in nature, and you can read plenty of research papers doing exactly that already. In the future, we expect these machines to help with climate models and research, as well as drug development and mechanical design. Second is for machine learning, which is a broad set of elements that enables the encoding of matrices and matrix operations. The hope is that by taking advantage of features such as superposition in quantum computers, parts of machine learning can be accelerated with quantum-focused algorithms. And third, we can use quantum computers for optimization or mathematical problems. The big model here is for travel and transportation optimizations, the classic traveling salesman's conundrum. But as it applies to logistics, supply chain, management, scheduling, network, and financial services. A subset of this is equation solving, and especially factoring. And it's the factoring that has people worried. This is because of how it plays into how we understand security and cryptography, our data, and what it means to be safe. In this video, I'm addressing an interesting juxtaposition. IBM is one of the market leaders in quantum computing, but I'm here in IBM Zurich Lab to learn about hardware they've already built to protect against the worst that quantum computers can do to our data. So to begin, let's cover what cryptography actually is and what it does. And for the sake of ease, I may call it crypto, but that hasn't got anything to do with ethereal currencies. In today's modern society, almost everything we interact with through our devices uses some form of security. This means not only when dealing with your bank details or logging into websites, but even accessing most of the web is handled through a secure connection. That's why you see this little lock on most of the websites you go to today. The modern HTTPS standard, where the S stands for security, uses encryption algorithm with pairs of numbers in a lock key configuration to provide that security. You may have heard of other types of encryption like this, RSA, DSA, ECC, DH, and others. Most of these are all public key protocols, relying on asymmetric pairs of numbers, primes, such that when multiplied together, provide a unique number to identify the user. One feature of a good encryption standard is that it's easy to encrypt, but hard to decrypt, unless you actually know the numbers. It's called asymmetric because the encryption and decryption D's keys are different. One is public, the other is private. It's a bit more complex than that in most cases, but in order to break the code the hard way, you need to be able to calculate the two numbers that make up the final multiplied number. A lot of standards require 2048-bit numbers, a number large enough that would take a modern computer around a million years to break just once. All these cryptography systems underpin the mechanism of data or authentication, which is often interpreted as security. It is often a race against time to develop and use algorithms that will be impervious to attack as modern computer hardware gets more and more powerful. It relies on modern digital infrastructure to be adaptable. These are things like passport security, digital signatures, critical control and infrastructure systems, and financial systems. In certain cases, it's not just communication, but stored data needs security as well, such as safety reports, health records, and the need to conform to all legal requirements for data security. So anyone with the right tools to break encryption could cause multiple problems, either by manipulating data, selling data, or extortion, or literally changing the history of data and communications. Fortunately, for now, it would take millions of years on traditional computational hardware to break most good encryption methods, but that's not an eternal guarantee. And even then, one of the biggest threats to this is called Shor's algorithm, first devised in 1994. Shor's algorithm provides a route to calculating the large factors of a large number. Starting with an initial guess, Shor's algorithm aims to find better and better guesses to factor a large number to break the encryption method. And one of the big parts of the algorithm, however, is a computationally expensive calculation to narrow down those guesses. When applied to quantum computers and using what is called a quantum Fourier transform, the algorithm can essentially test 
a large number of possible values, correct or incorrect, and pull out the one that works best. And then, over time, very quickly, the encryption could be broken. Despite being devised in 1994, Shor's algorithm is very difficult to implement. Even with modern quantum computers, the biggest fact number factored I could find is 15, which, of course, a five-year-old can do. The threat is that when quantum computers get big enough, we're currently seeing chips at 400 qubits, there may be chips with 1,000, 3,000, 5,000. Where does it end? When the chips get big enough and powerful enough, then it will, be, then it will take a relatively trivial amount of time to solve a 10,000 digit number like we can do with two digit numbers in classical computing today. As a result, there has been a modern push to develop security standards that are called quantum safe, such that even a quantum computer like this one won't help you break them. If you are based in the USA, you may have heard of NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology. There are other institutions that exist in other countries, such as the NCSC for the UK, BSI for Germany, ENISA for Europe and others. But in 2016, NIST held a formal call for a new set of standards to enable quantum safe cryptography. In July 2022, four algorithms were listed as finalists for the draft standards. Now, one of these is based on hash cryptography. It's called Sphinx Plus. It's very complex, a little slower than the others, but it's regarded as like a suitable option as a backup if the concept of other types of cryptography are broken. It's the other three we're going to focus on, and these are all based on lattice cryptography, which I think I can explain with a fun representation. Imagine you have an image, and you want to basically hide this image from everybody else, so you encrypt it. You encrypt it with an algorithm, and then somebody comes along and tries to decrypt it with a special lens. If you've got that classical computing lens, it's going to take time for you to decrypt the image. You can't see the structure of the image very clearly. However, with a quantum computing lens, you can see the structure of, say, the house in the image very quickly and hopefully break the data in a short amount of time. Now, if you use a quantum safe cryptography encryption method, even with that quantum lens, no matter how much you fiddle with it, the idea is that you won't be able to see any structure in the data. You won't be able to take any guesses in how to break the encryption method. What we're looking at today is lattice cryptography algorithms that have been developed essentially over the last two decades. And we've found that there is no lenses capable of being able to find the structure in encrypted data. That makes them good candidates for future encryption. So out of the four standards that NIST have finalized, IBM and its partners have had a hand in three of them. In preparation for the standardization, IBM is already putting these techniques into its hardware, enabling acceleration on its modern systems such as Z16 and Linux One. Now, if you've seen my channel before, I've spoken multiple times about IBM's architecture known as Z. It has a long historic lineage, and the latest CPU design is called Telem. Hi, my name is Christian Jacobi. I'm the chief architect for Z processor design. And today, I'm introducing the IBM Telem chip. Telem is the next generation processor for IBM Z and Linux One systems. We can find it today in both the Z16 mainframe database hardware used by financial institutions and security institutions around the world, as well as fourth generation Linux One hardware for small to medium businesses. I recently did a video on the fourth generation Linux One family. You should go check that out in the links in the description below. Inside each of these systems is a quantum safe cryptography accelerator built from the ground up to take advantage of lattice cryptography and provide security that even quantum computers will have a difficult time to crack. Currently, this sits in the Z system, in the Linux One system, as an FPGA on the hardware security module attached over PCIe, but in the future, it will be built into each chip. We even spent time today at the tape lab here at IBM. IBM, yes, still has plenty of research into tape storage, and they've already implemented their quantum safe cryptography in their tape storage devices. Now, it's still, it's been there for a couple of years, but it's still not in a product yet. But the point is, IBM is putting in place into its uh, business st style products to get into market with a quantum safe strategy. However, it's not simply having the hardware and the standards and leaving it there. As I mentioned before, sometimes it's the update cycle of the critical infrastructure parts like passport control that are slow to update and take on new standards. They can be slow to update simply because of all the massive monoliths involved. There's legacy encryption, there's legacy data. It's all intertwined and not easily solvable. And this is kind of why IBM is engaging in company, with companies today. Companies are looking to update their security portfolio 
and they engage with IBM to go through a three-stage repeatable process. This process is discovery, observation, and transformation. I could spend a whole video talking about it, but out of all of this, it's the discovery part that has me most intrigued. As IBM told me that no single company, no matter what they say, actually knows where all of their cryptography is. Now that sounds a bit weird, but for a start, you can't simply rip out all your encryption protocols up and replace them. First, you have to find them. Cryptography standards in a modern business infrastructure are everywhere. We're talking hardware to software, software to software, network point to point. Anywhere data sits, where it's moved from, where it's moved to, could be encrypted. Some of it is done in the hardware, such as total memory encryption, or by the Ethernet controller as it moves from system to system, or it could be encrypted in software, such as with hypervisors, or with additional encryption on top that is enabled by hardware security modules. After identifying where the cryptography is, or finding out exactly how many rabbit holes each part of your infrastructure likes to go down, eventually implementing an end-to-end -end quantum safe cryptography is a process. As much as it might be tempting to just have that an upper layer shield protecting everything, it's actually being able to control and maintain that cryptography solution long term is just as important as installing it in the first place, especially as standards evolve. It's also the ability to monitor gaps in security and minimizing them. It's a whole entire roadmap, not a band-aid. This is a chance for companies to redefine the baseline for future encryption. IBM is partnering with customers to enable their quantum safe cryptography transformation. For example, IBM is partnering with Vodafone, a global telecommunications brand, and they're currently in the preparation process with monitoring tools to help identify cryptography in use in their core telecommunications components. The second example they show me is a large European bank, which is currently using a quantum safe sandbox to test different use cases and performance. This will both help them prepare for future adoption of quantum safe cryptography, but also help train their employee base and gain a post quantum cryptography experience. Of course, IBM is working with more than two companies and many of them are coming into their quantum safe journey at different points. Beyond the standard algorithms and hardware, IBM is already providing experimentation with its remediator software. It also has the advisor software to examine a code base for vulnerabilities and prioritization then there is the Explorer features for dependency analysis and working towards automation of crypto agility strategies such that any cryptography security solution required in the future is no longer too integrated to tease out an update. All in all, this video isn't designed to be a scare video. I'm not trying to get you to all run out today and talk to your IT managers about being quantum safe tomorrow. A quantum cryptography attack is still a while away, and the standards to remain safe are still in the process of being validated and standardized. But the key thing to take away here is that updating the encryption methods in modern infrastructure is a long, arduous, and tedious, and difficult task. So it's important that the steps are being put in place today or soon to ensure that all of our data is kept safe. If you have enjoyed this video, don't forget to like and subscribe, hit that bell for future notifications, and if you like this video, please leave a comment down below. If you didn't like it, tell me why. And let me know what else you want to see on the channel.